yes to divorce. Catholic Malta votes to legalize it. Are the devout Christians of Malta growing less faithful or simply more realistic about marriage? Are we seeing a fundamental shift in Maltese society? This is Inside Story. And a warm welcome to the programme. I'm Laura Kyle. So today to Malta, where on Sunday votes were being counted in this predominantly Catholic Mediterranean state of just 400,000 people. And results showed the people there have chosen to legalise divorce. As this show was being recorded, counting showed 52% of voters said yes. Now, Malta is one of the only countries in the world where divorce is still illegal. That's alongside the Philippines and Vatican City. It's been a burning issue for many years. Malta's prime minister, who was anti the introduction of divorce, has announced that he accepts the will of the majority and that it's now up to Parliament to pass a law which will complete the process. Uh, certainly a very interesting debate, one that goes right to the heart of the institution of marriage. And here to discuss it via broadband are our three guests. Michael Folsom, a senior member of the Yes Movement, joining us from Valletta, the capital of Malta. David Quinn, director of the pro-marriage group, the Iona Institute, and commentator for the Irish Independent from Dublin. And from San Juan, also in Malta, Matthew Vella, editor of Malta Today. Thank you all, gentlemen for being with us. Now, first of all, let's get some reaction to this referendum result. Michael Falzen, certainly a good day for you. Yes, it has been, certainly. Beyond, beyond my dreams. <laughs> was it, a, vote, was it a, a result that you expected? Well, uh, our polls showed that we had a slight lead all the time, but I also had the hunch that some people were not showing that they were going to vote yes. Uh, because in certain circles uh, you would be sort of taught that you are uh, an anti-church, so they wouldn't like to show that. But then when they are alone in the, in the polling booth, they would, they would vote yes. And I think that was what happened. So did you feel when you were campaigning that it was uh, an issue that, that you had to change people's minds on, or was this something that the people of Malta have wanted for some time? Well, I think society has changed in the last uh, decades, two or three decades. Uh, we have a lot of people who are separated and have formed uh, family units which are not recognized uh, by the state. They are, have uh, partners who cannot marry because there is no divorce, and they have children. And we are saying this is, I, I was arguing that this is, uh, give, brings about social disorder and that it was the duty of the state to regularize this, the situations of these couples, which we are families, all in, in name and actual families, but not recognized by the state. Okay, uh, David Quinn, if I can bring you in at this point, because you've lived through the same process happening in Ireland through the 80s and 90s. What's your reaction to the events today in Malta? Well, I guess not entirely surprising, because what is surprising probably is that Malta has held out so long against divorce, right up until uh, 2011. We had two referendums on divorce. We had one in 1986 that was resoundingly defeated by a margin of two to one, and then a second one in 1995 that was uh, passed by the most narrow of margins, namely 0.7%. Um, and then in 1997, two years after that, roughly, we actually had managed to frame the law that would uh, permit divorce in Ireland. And uh, I believe that Maltese law is to be based on the Irish law. Uh, one thing your previous speaker said that struck me was, um, uh, and it was an argument that was used in Ireland at the time we introduced divorce, it would allow people who were separated to, uh, to get married and therefore to regularize their unions. Um, the prime minister of Ireland at the time, uh, he predicted that the introduction of divorce would reduce cohabitation levels in Ireland. In fact, back then, cohabitation was uh, very rare in Ireland, and the prediction that it would further reduce co uh, cohabitation proved to be utterly and completely unfounded. In fact, according to the census data from 1996 until 2006, the level of cohabitation in Ireland went up 400 percent. We now have more cohabitation in Ireland per head of population than the United States and only slightly behind Great Britain. So anybody in Malta who thinks that the introduction of divorce uh, is going to reduce cohabitation is simply dreaming. 
Uh, Michael Fulton, what do you say to that, uh, the, the rise never, of cohabitation? That, I never said that it is reduced cohabitation. I'm saying that there are people who are cohabiting, they want to marry, they are, uh, and, and they have a right to, for their union to be recognized. Cohabitation, the reason for cohabitation nowadays, I don't think it is so much directly connected with divorce. You, there is a trend among young people in Europe, and this is, trend is also spreading into Malta, where young people go and live together, uh, sort of marriage trial, uh, without, uh, without marrying. It would be interesting to check the ages of the people who, who are cohabiting in, in Ireland. And you will see that the increase of uh, cohabitation is the result of this trend, nothing to do with uh, the fact that there is divorce. OK, well, let's bring in uh, Matthew Vella at this point, uh, editor of Malta Today. And Matthew, do you think that the passing of this referendum and down the line of uh, the law legalising divorce is going to lead to a rise in cohabitation rates in Malta? Or is that uh, predominantly something that we see happening in Ireland and the UK and not an issue for the Maltese? Yeah, well, um, uh, cohabitation is actually already quite common in Malta, for example. Uh, just by way of statistics, uh, in the space of uh, 10 years, cohabitation has increased from 605 uh, households to 25,000. So cohabitation is already a reality in Malta, even by way of legal separation. You have people who are separating, um, and these ex-spouses are forming new families with, with other people. You have also uh, younger people who are uh, choosing to live with their partners before they get married. I think it's a reality which is, uh, which is quite uh, in parallel with the rest of European society. So I think with or without divorce, and in Mota's case, it's certainly without divorce, cohabitation was already a reality for young people and for people who had no other choice but to live with their new partners if they had separated from their previous spouse. Uh, one of the arguments uh, against divorce that we've seen in Malta is that it may well lead to the, the breakdown of society, Maltese uh, society, uh, very strongly in favour of the family. Do you think that uh, with the introduction of this law that you will see a breakdown in society? Well, it, a breakdown in society is a very harsh way of describing it. Uh, Malta's society is not perfect. In many ways, it does resemble societies in Europe, which other people have called broken. Uh, the truth is that uh, any observer who comes to Malta would say that the majority of Maltese marriages are actually very solid. And it's true, the majority of Maltese marriages uh, have no real problems of marital breakdown. However, once again, the high number of children which are born out of wedlock, the increasing uh, pattern of cohabitation and the rising trends uh, of marriage breakdown, even because of legal separation, means that it's a, it's a reality that uh, nobody can ignore. And divorce was actually presented as a legal remedy for many of these people who are experiencing marital breakdown. David Quinn, in your experience, has, has this law been a, a positive for Irish society? Well, I mean, I, I suppose what's curious here in Ireland is... Um, Again, if you go back to 1986, compare it with 2006, the number of people in Ireland who have suffered marital breakdown has gone up 500%. It's gone up, up to about 200,000 people. But of them, only a third have divorced and two thirds are separated. So the Irish pattern appears to be, uh, if your marriage has gotten into severe difficulties and you opt for legal separation, that means you can settle your maintenance uh, payments, you can settle your property set, um, uh, 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 between you, and you can also obviously sort out custody and access um, uh, of children. Uh, so only about a third of Irish people who separate so far have gone on to divorce. So divorce seems to be only sought in Ireland when uh, one spouse in the previous couple then seeks to remarry. Um, so as I said, we have this curious thing, two thirds of people who are separated don't uh, get divorced. Um, but in terms of measuring the health of marriage in a particular society, and there's a number of ways to do it. One is to look at the divorce and separation rate. And Ireland's divorce and separation rate, even taken together, is still a lot lower than Britain or America's. So we haven't seen this huge surge, despite the 500% increase, that was from a very low level. We're not anything like the British or American levels yet. 
where we are closing in very rapidly on British or American levels is cohabitation that's actually above American levels, close to British levels. Also, number of births outside wedlock is now one in three. And I think a key, um, a, a key central issue, in fact, the key central issue in the debate in any country about, about marriage and the family is, do we think it's desirable that as many children as possible are raised by their own mother and father, you know, provided the mother and father are not abusive and so on? Um, in Ireland, about one in four children now are not being raised by their married mother and father, and that is up, uh, you know, 100 percent in the last 10 or 20 years. Right. Uh, okay. I'm just going to now from what, what you previously. I'm just going to cut in there because yeah. options do already exist for Maltese couple who want Maltese couples who want to end their marriage, and it's important just to make this point because one is that they can already get divorced overseas if they like. Another is an annulment of the marriage, and this is a process that takes about eight years, and it states that the marriage never existed in the first place. And there's a third option, which is legal separation, where two parties may live apart, but never, in fact, remarry. Now, between 2007 and 2009, Malta recognised 102 cases of divorce that were granted to Maltese couples by foreign countries. In the past five years, 690 annulments have been carried out by both the church and the state in Malta. And between 2006 and 2008, there were around 3,500 separation applications submitted or mediations introduced with 1,000 more cases pending. Now, Michael Folzen, I want to ask you that these mechanisms already exist in Malta for people who want to uh, end their marriage. So why do we need to formalize it in divorce as well? Well, uh, it's not really end, uh, end the process of end your marriage. When you separate legally, you are still married. So separate is separation. Legal separation means the couple are living independent of each other, but uh, technically they are still husband and wife. And because they are still husband and wife, they cannot remarry. And uh, that is where the disorder in society was being, I think, was being uh, created. It is interesting to know that uh, the rate of marriage breakdown is, in Malta is equivalent to that uh, in the European mainstream, in the European Union. So uh, the only thing that was missing was people who want to remarry. And this is the whole point of divorce. Um, separated people are still married legally, and, by, and they still have the legal obligations um, at law. For example, believe it or not, separated people are still obliged to, to be faithful to each other. And when one is not faithful to the, to the other party, uh, if, if she's the woman getting maintenance, she loses the, the alimony. Um, separation is not not the end of marriage. And um, a lot of people are separated, people who have been separated for 20 years in Malta are living the legal fiction that they are man and wife, when uh, the only solution, the, the reality is that they are not man and wife, and the only solution to, to resolve this, uh, do away with this legal fiction, is to introduce divorce. OK, uh, Matthew Vella, this point of uh, people in Malta being given the chance uh, potentially to remarry appears to be a key one. I mean, it seems essentially this is an issue about freedom of choice. Exactly. Uh, in fact, one of the most dominant themes of the entire referendum was uh, having the freedom to choose for yourself, to, have, um, to, have, uh, to choose your status and not having the church or the state imposing uh, a, a status just because you, we, uh, you don't have the legal remedy to divorce. So in this case, people who were separated were forced to cohabit literally because there was no divorce. It is a question of, um, of freedom of choice. I mean, uh, the role of the church in this, the, in this divorce referendum was quite large. Um, it was a campaign that was, the, the anti-divorce campaign was backed by the Catholic Church. There was immense pressure, pressure uh, brought upon uh, many voters who were actually scared into going out to vote or uh, voting yes for what is a civil right. And, uh, and all along, the, the argument was that uh, an individual right 
should be sacrificed for the alleged common good. In this case, uh, the um, referendum result is really a resounding, um, uh, a resounding vote in favor of, of, uh, of people's rights to choose. Okay, well, let's a look a little of, bit. A life look, which they wish to live. Let's look a little bit more at this uh, issue of religion in this uh, referendum. Uh, we said before that the Philippines and Vatican City are the only two other countries which do not allow divorce. And Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, head of the Roman Catholic Church, has endorsed the Maltese Church's battle against divorce. That was during his visit to Malta in April last year, when he said. Your nation should continue to stand up for the indissolubility of marriage as a natural institution as well as a sacramental one. David Quinn, uh, if we look back again to uh, the events that unfolded in Ireland, did you see a similar involvement in the church in the uh, no group, should we say? Well, we did, although in 1995 um, it was much weaker than in 1986 because in 19, between 1986 and 1995 some of the abuse scandals involving priests uh, began to uh, make uh, the headlines and therefore the church by 1996, uh, or, or, or 95 rather, when the referendum took place had been greatly weakened, so therefore it was mainly uh, lay groups who were involved and it wasn't particularly religious arguments that were used against divorce. It was more arguments to do with the common good. And, you know, it was very much the kind of arguments uh, that we're having here now on the various issues which we're debating. If I can just very quickly, by the way, address the freedom of choice issue. You see, um, the type of divorce we have in Ireland, which is very widespread in the Western world, is no fault unilateral divorce. It means that one spouse can be divorced against their will, no choice in the matter at all. So if I, choose, if I chose to divorce my wife, let's say, she would have no choice in the matter but to be divorced. Um, so in fact, the pro-choice rhetoric is actually quite empty in many ways, because once you introduce unilateral no-fault divorce, one spouse can be divorced against their will, and choice simply does not come into it at all. But the key issue for me is, whether it be Malta or Ireland or Britain or America or wherever, is what do we do to actually, and this is whether we have divorce or not, what do we do to strengthen the institution of marriage? Because we can't simply look at figures like rising number of births outside marriage, rising separation, rising divorce, rising cohabitation, and think, look, this is something, uh, you know, just like the weather that we have no control over. Um, Malta, Ireland, etc., and, and I presume the two Maltese uh, gentlemen are probably going to agree with me here, Malta and Ireland and other countries should make strenuous efforts insofar as they possibly can, to reduce the number of births outside wedlock, to reduce the amount of cohabitation, to maximise the number of children who have been raised by their married mother and father. Because at the end of the day, family policy must be based on maximising the welfare of children. And in general, in general, the welfare of children is maximised by as many as possibly being raised, being raised by their own mother and father. So it seems to me this is where the debate needs to shift in Malta. And it, hasn't, it isn't where it shifted in Ireland, actually, because people are terrified of causing offence to people in different family forms, and so we actually don't promote marriage properly in Ireland at all. OK, and you've we, raised a number of points more. there, David. I just want to interrupt because there have been a number of important so, paint points that you've raised. I'd like to give uh, Michael Falzon a chance to respond to some of them. First of all, this point you raised uh, about concern that people will now be divorced against their will. Is that something that does concern you, Michael? Well, I don't think I don't think it should be uh, any problem, because if if um, a couple is divorced and uh, some one party does not want to re remarry, or because of his religious beliefs and his divorce against his will, okay, I admit that. But the other, the party can always uh, choose not to remarry, and there is no difference between the being divorced and not remarrying and uh, being separated in for practical terms. So it is true that uh, you could have some, you could have uh, cases of one person um, uh, uh, filing in for a divorce while his, his ex-wife or her ex-husband uh, does not agree with that. But um, where, unless if you, may, if you make it a condition that divorce has to be consensual, then we all know what happens. The part, one party tries to get money out of uh, selling her or his um, uh, go-ahead. Okay. Uh, there, you understand. Yeah, there was uh, the other important issue that, that David did raise, a fair issue, I 
I do believe, one about strengthening the institution of marriage whilst allowing for people to divorce if they do choose to. Yes, is, yes. is the Yes Camp doing anything to, to do no, so, no, to we, do that? We, we said that we endorse all efforts at, at strengthening the institution of marriage. And uh, we agree that the marriage should be the, the basic um, cell of, of our society. And uh, we agree that uh, efforts must be done to strengthen that institution, to give families a more, more, um, better environment to survive. But we cannot uh, ignore the fact that doing whatever you do for families there are going to you're going to have a number of families which break down, and you cannot say that you that you can make a program that will save all marriages because that is fictitious. So while we are all for strengthening families and avoiding and avoiding um, marriage breakdown, and even the, the proposed divorce bill says that uh, the, you must have um, an effort at reconciliation, and the judge must be convinced that there is no chance, no hope of this marriage ever uh, being uh, made up, you know. So we agree with that, but we still can't, because of that, because of the ideal of having all strong families, we cannot ignore the fact that some families break down. Okay. Uh, Matthew Bello, if I could just uh, return to the issue of religion just for one moment, because uh, it's so entwined with this issue of divorce. The Roman Catholic Church, obviously, anti-divorce. Do you think uh, the, the influence of Roman Catholicism in Malta has been damaged by simply having this debate? Well, oh, definitely. I, I mean, uh, let me just start by the beginning of the campaign. There were casualties in this debate. The figurehead of the Yes movement, Deborah Shkembri, uh, was suspended from practicing her, her legal profession in the ecclesiastical tribunals for taking a stand in favor, a vocal stand in favor of divorce. Um, there were harsh um, uh, comments from people like the Gossetan Bishop, Mario Greg, um, about Catholics who were in favor of divorce. And uh, some people allegedly were denied Holy Communion or the absolution of sins for declaring the yes vote. And priests also came out in public uh, denouncing the behavior of the Catholic Church uh, with, with a, a major part of the electorate. So the Catholic Church, which has a very considerable and significant um, position in Maltese society, was very active in, the, in this referendum. Now, you mentioned, has it come out any worse? Even if the referendum had been uh, won by the No Movement, it would certainly have been a Pyrrhic victory for the Church. We're running very much out of time. I just want to uh, give one more word to uh, David Quinn, just quickly, because you've lived through this. You're, you're seeing the, the effects of introducing divorce. People now have the chance to remarry. They, they are able to get divorced. Are you seeing a happier society there in Ireland? Well, I mean, the answer is no. Uh, and you see, if I can return to the point, um, you know, we have seen, and it's not directly the result, by the way, of introducing divorce. Uh, there is, you know, no doubt more family breakdown here than there was, far more than there was, let's say, in the 1970s or 1980s. None of the people in Ireland, uh, and I mean none, who campaigned for divorce have done anything to strengthen the institution of marriage. Uh, they, are, they, they are actually actively in favour of further eroding the status by giving, by giving the rights of married couples to cohabiting couples, we say, the same-sex couples, by giving adoption rights to single people, cohabiting couples, same-sex couples, etc. So the liberalizing trend represented by divorce has carried on to the great detriment of marriage. So it would be a very surprising thing if the people in Malta who are pro-divorce will be also the ones behind strengthening the institution of marriage in the future, running public education campaigns in its favour, seeking to reduce levels of, co of cohabitation, etc. I simply don't see that happening. I hope it does happen. But if the pro-divorce side came in on the side of marriage in favour of uh, marriage strengthening proposals, it would be unique in the world. Certainly a fascinating discussion, and it will be very interesting to see how events play out and affect Maltese society. Thank you to all our guests for joining us today, Michael Folson and Matthew Vella in Malta, David Quinn in Dublin.
And many thanks to you too for watching this edition of Inside Story. As always, we welcome your comments and suggestions. Do email them to us at insidestory at altazira.net. Bye for now.